Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start off today's presentation the same way I start off most of the conversations I've had about this uh, for the last two years, and that's filling you guys in on what exactly esports are. <laughs> so um, you hear the word, you might think of a few things, and often in conversations I just say, it's professional gaming, and we nod at each other and, and kind of go from there without uh, any more attention. But now that I have a little bit more captive of an audience, I'm gonna explain it in depth a little bit more. Uh, so it's this really fascinating uh, trend in gaming and actually has spawned this really cool industry that is really a smashing together convergence of geek and jock culture, which uh, for all intents and purposes we've been trained to think are diametrically opposed. So it's at times really fascinating and other times really frightening. It's, it's still fraught with a lot of issues of lack of diversity, uh, sexism, you name it, uh, it's still very white male dominated and still a very bro-y kind of inappropriate culture that's still finding its, its way around. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that it's not just this professional level that I'm going to be talking about here. I'm focusing mainly on the very highest level with the, the highest stakes, the big broadcasts. But it goes all the way down to the, the lowest grassroots things. We have esports e clubs here at MIT who just a group of students get together. And they can, if they want to, uh, broadcast their game to a much larger audience at any time. They're involved in a few different leagues that are at the collegiate level that are doing the same sorts of things you're seeing in these big broadcasts. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that this often comes with, uh, did he just say sport? Uh, how, how is guys sitting down playing a video game sport? And I don't want to rehash that argument, and I don't think that this discussion here has anything to do with that argument. You'll see me constantly referring to and comparing to traditional sports broadcast models, because that's really what esports broadcasting borrows from and how they're informed. So it's really important to acknowledge that, but I don't need to talk to you about whether darts or chess is a sport or video gaming is a sport. I just don't think it's that important. And, then, and lastly, I want to point out the thing that really makes esports look and feel like sports in these broadcasts, and that's the shoutcasters, which uh, I could give you a, a verbal explanation of, but I'd, I'd much rather just show you. Observer there, and he doesn't really get much. much. And Bunny, oh my gosh, he's taking the high ground! This is huge, it's gonna force him into a fight! He's to come in, and oh my god, this could be the last fight of the game. The clock deals so much damage at this point. The rage from all of them, and Bunny just walked up into the nothingness, and that was the difference between San and Bunny today. He takes that fight that we've been looking for, and that by Bunny was not the best move, and now San jumps and pounces, and it affords an opportunity to finally go through to the semi-finals. Bunny holds him back behind the cell, no, tower, but this is Sand's chance. He brings down the last couple of Vikings. Colossus will go untouched, and an epic series will go into five games is going to go in favor of the... <laughs> so yeah, it's it's pretty fun stuff, and you, the audio was more important than the video here because this is probably gibberish to you. Anyway, uh, the, the cool thing to note here is that it sounds like a sports broadcast is kind of indistinguishable but if you just took the audio track out. On top of that, you have you have branding here in the top corner. You also have new ways that they're figuring out how to get sponsors and logos into the actual gameplay itself. So it's really taking on this kind of uh, Monday Night Football feel. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to, to my actual project, with, which is esports broadcasting in comparison with traditional sports broadcasting models. And, and my main thread through this whole thing is that esports broadcasting is informed by and follows a trajectory set out by traditional sports media, but it's not really in a position to be able to copy those things wholesale, and it's actually running into a few issues here. So it's had to innovate where it can't uh, just copy, and it's had to kind of learn the hard way that not all of these things are replicable. Uh, so to break down the, the presentation today, uh, I'm going to start with a discussion of those shoutcasters, which the word shoutcaster comes from uh, the old software they used to use called Shoutcast, uh, which was a very early, early 2000s uh, streaming software that allowed these guys to uh, watch a game and then give audio commentary, much like sports radio and broadcast it to, to small kind of internet radio stations where maybe a few hundred people would hear it in the entire lifetime of the broadcast. 
Uh, and that word, the shoutcast FM, has really held on. It signals the history of this. And a shoutcaster is effectively just an esports caster. Uh, so it's the exact same role, but they actually have taken on a lot more responsibility than your traditional sports casters. So they're in this kind of flex position of balancing traditional sports casting with gaming. Uh, gaming and sports are different. They, they pose different challenges, and these guys are, are in between the two of them. Uh, they also see community maintenance as a really important part of their job. And that's one of the cool things about esports is that it's gotten really big, but it's not big enough that you don't know what's going on everywhere in esports. Uh, and the first generation of casters, these guys from the early 2000s, they really, their only touch points were in traditional sports broadcasting. This second generation of casters that are just emerging now, that it's getting huge, all of them don't look to traditional sports as their primary touch point, but instead are looking at other esports casters. So you're seeing a disconnect starting to form from esports casting and traditional sports casting. Um, and I just want to mention here that this will work with my field work uh, with the ESL, and also I was able to do a whole bunch of interviews with professional shoutcasters. Uh, so all of this data is coming from those interviews and those conversations. I've had countless conversations while at ESL about all these things. Uh, the next thing I'll be jumping into is sports media and esports, and kind of situating esports broadcasting and especially live streaming in the larger media landscape of traditional sports casting. Traditional sports have started streaming. A uh, little known fact that in 2003, the MLB actually broadcast a thousand games online. Not many people really know that it even happened and it wasn't that successful, but they were doing it. They've been doing it for a while. Um, but they're in this kind of difficult position of finding out exactly what they should be doing. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, the different transitions from print all the way to live streaming and these transition moments of creating different sort of touch points and, and collecting conventions while creating your own. Finally, I'm going to look at the revenue streams for both. Uh, what you're seeing happening with the sponsorships and logos showing up that I showed you there is esports broadcasting is borrowing almost wholesale from traditional sports, but their revenue streams aren't identical. And they're actually very different in a few different ways that I'd like to get into later. But by looking at these revenue streams, you can really see that the traditional sports model isn't replicable. Uh, you can't take the NFL's uh, kind of revenue stream, which is sometimes not a revenue stream, and put that into esports. It just won't work. So starting out, uh, talking about shoutcasters in general, uh, this this image here is, is showing you the. Oh, oh well, no. <laughs> hmm. Oh, so you guys missed that whole last slide, too. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, that was that, was that slide. That was what I was talking about. Um, so looking at this image here, wow, the first time I don't look back. <laughs> Uh, so, just showing you the transition, the, the top image is the same guy as the bottom image, uh, and that is from 2009. So that's an event from 2009, and then the, the lower picture is just from about three weeks ago. And you can see the like crazy transition from long hair uh, and t-shirt and jeans broadcaster to uh, what effectively is a traditional sportscaster. And if Joe is watching this at some point, I'm really sorry that I dragged that picture out of, out of the desk. Um, so these guys are somewhere in between sportscasters and the community. They're, they're both fans and professionals. And it's an interesting dichotomy that they talk about a lot in these interviews. So they all kind of got their start in this grassroots uh, do-it-yourself uh, and a lot of people like to talk about the passion, the, the cult of passion in esports, where it's just a bunch of people who are really, really into gaming, really, really into esports, and they go out of their way for great lengths to, to kind of create a profession out of this. And the shoutcasters are really a, a perfect example of this, and they're the what I would argue the primary signifier of this sports part of esports. Uh, so if you look at some of the earlier casters, they they will without uh, blinking, just let you know that their roots are in traditional sports casting. 
the, the earliest one I know of would take his laptop and he set it up and he let me know that he would listen to hours of football and uh, soccer radio just to kind of learn those the transition moments, how to hand off the end of a segment, how to handle dead air, uh, all those things that he was just a gamer. He had no idea what he was doing, but he took it upon himself to educate himself by going to traditional sports casting. So they borrow those transitions, those moments, and even the wardrobe has started to resemble uh, traditional sports. They've, they've gone the whole game. They, they started with a t-shirt and jeans, went all the way up to full suit and tie, and, and realized, well, that might be a little too much. We're still, we're still gamers, we're still geeks, and, and we're going to reflect that through our wardrobe too. So they brought it back down a little bit, but there's not that much of a difference there. So one really crazy thing about esports is that a career in this, people talk about burnout rates constantly, and one of the big issues is that a career in esports might last two years. A professional player who is between 18 and 20 might have one season worth of playing in them, and very few go beyond three or four years ever. The same thing with organizations and coaches. Uh, you have teams that will form and disband within a year. Uh, some notable exceptions to that, like Fnatic or SK Gaming, have been around for quite a long time, but they constantly are shuffling through rosters, and there's almost no kind of standing backbone of esports besides these esports companies and these shoutcasters who end up becoming the gatekeepers for the community, they become the history keepers and the stat keepers. There's no place to go for all of the uh, stats from the earliest esports matches. It's, it's lucky to find out who won a match five years ago, much less get the actual um, nitty gritty details from it. But these shoutcasters go out of their way to aggregate this stuff. They all have their own kind of databases and there's been an influx of those sites popping up with the help of APIs and, and uh, shoutcasters to really formalize the, the stats in this to resemble traditional sports. So uh, another thing that comes in is this broadcast persona. These guys become the face of esports, they become the sound of esports, and as, as you could tell there, there's not much of a difference in the audio. So they resemble traditional sportscasters, and then building on traditional sportscasters and news anchors, they become a sort of personality that people can interact with. Uh, and, and this is known as parasocial interaction. Uh, I'll nod my hat to uh, Ed in the back there, who, who did a great uh, meta-analysis of this to find out that by creating a persona and becoming a character with regular schedule and broadcasting, you make a greater connection and actually put people in more often. But this comes back to the actual medium of live streaming, which is both the audio visual feed and an internet relay chat next, next door. So you have everybody, whether it's 10,000 or 200, all of the people in that uh, Twitch stream are able to chat with one another, and the broadcasters can link right into that chat as well and respond to it, and often do. Um, so these shoutcasters are very aware of that and have taken it up as their duty to kind of do this community maintenance, get information out there and respond to the community, building this kind of really great, rich connection. And then you have this second generation of casters coming in now that are throwing off their traditional sports model altogether, and their only touch points are these earlier casters. So they've learned things like dead, handling dead air or handling uh, a handoff at the end of the segment from their other casters. And one of them even told me, like, I don't, I don't watch sports at all. I don't. There's nothing I can learn from it. Which is this amazing disconnect from his earlier casters because all they looked at and all they learned from was traditional sports. So they've kind of taken this community aspect to the next level and, and see it as almost a requirement that every broadcast they will respond to a stream, they will let people know like, hey, yeah, I'm listening, if you have feedback, I'll, I'll check it out. While the older casters look at it more like, yeah, I understand that the feedback's there, but I'm not gonna, not really gonna engage with it or acknowledge it. These guys aren't professional casters, so I'll go talk to other casters if I want feedback about what I'm doing. Uh, so it really boils down to what live streaming is and what they have access to. So the text is kind of small on this, I'll, I'll help you out with that, but through the evolution of sports media, you have live streaming um, emerging 
relatively recently, I mean, the first really good live streaming platforms were early 2000s with uh, Justin TV and what we're streaming on right now, Ustream, showing up around 2007, 2008, and Twitch TV, the primary streaming platform for live streaming, for uh, esports, is only a few years old. It came out in 2011 and has since blown up. You might have noticed recently that uh, Amazon acquired them for $970 million. So you have esports emerging at a time where it was prohibitively expensive to get into to live streaming, and it was also almost impossible to break into television. Um, television's kind of been set, it's, it's tough to get into, and for a long time, esports casters and companies thought that the way to go would be to get into uh, traditional sports, or I mean, into television broadcasts, and uh, TL has a great case study about uh, the CGS, uh, which was this kind of early partnering of DirecTV with uh, really big names in the esports industry in 2007 and 2008, and the first earnest attempt to bring esports to television, and it failed pretty miserably. Uh, so it was once again relegated to live streaming. The, the interesting thing about live streaming is that it's more accessible than television, but as it grows up, it's kind of brushing into these, these other entities. You have print coming out of this, uh, you have audio casts, podcasts coming up from esports, and the streams are resembling television more often than not. And uh, this live streaming image I have here is just from two nights ago, actually. Um, there's, you can't see there, but uh, 90,000 people in that chat. So it's almost unintelligible. It becomes almost the roar of a stadium uh, because nobody can read it, and it just is memes and emoticons, you name it. Um, so as we look at the different agendas of each of these media, uh, print and, and radio are very early on focused strictly as sports news. Their, their goal was to get the information there, to get fans to be able to tune in and find out what's going on in this world. It wasn't until kind of the golden age of baseball and radio uh, that you saw this news switch over into entertainment, which television and live streaming have both really taken up this mantra of, of entertainment before news. And with this, you see a massive commercialization. Uh, so television in particular, um, you might see some of the scary figures come out, which I'll get into shortly, uh, of just this huge amounts of sponsorship dollars and media rights going into these things. And live streaming is sort of, sort of starting to borrow from that as well, and is funded primarily through um, through sponsorships and publisher relations. Uh, so one thing I wanted to point to with, with live streaming is that it's actually a melding together of a few of these. So uh, William Hamilton et al. Uh, just a few years ago took up McLuhan and Oldenburg's ideas of hot and cold media as well as third places to situate live streaming as this kind of new entity which creates this third place for communities to kind of coalesce and, and connect really richly, and I'm just going to give a quick quote from that. He says, by combining hot and cool media, streams enable sharing rich, ephemeral experiences in tandem with open participation through informal social interaction, ingredients for a third place. So what he means by hot and cool media, which is coming directly from McLuhan, is that uh, your televisual broadcast is a very hot medium. It's very um, active, and then something like print or uh, or the internet relay chat next to a stream is going to be a totally different act interaction and a totally different way of engaging with this broadcast, but combining the two creates this kind of interesting space in general. Um, so that brings me to my, my conversation here of, of the revenue stream. So as I mentioned, there are models in traditional sportscasting that just don't fit into esports. And the primary one I'd like to, to flag here is that Media rights in traditional sports uh, account for 31% of the revenue uh, in traditional sports broadcasting, whereas in esports, it accounts for 4%. So they're relying on completely different sort of met methods here. And the media rights kind of uh, bidding war that started, and I'll just give a quick tidbit that the NFL sold its broadcasting rights in 2011 through the 2020-2021 uh, season for $20 billion, and 
and that all started back with uh, Pete Rozelle, uh, an NFL commissioner, who, who kind of got the teams together to negotiate together. Originally, teams would sell out their, their media rights to um, specific outlets, but Pete Rozelle got them together and then made the, the outlets come to them. So you have NBC, CBS, and Fox coming to the collective of NFL and having to negotiate a kind of group contract, which started back then with a, a it went from about $75,000 for broadcasting rights to a few million in just a few years. And we're now at a point where they're selling it for 20 billion. Each of the three big networks are paying an average of 1 billion per year just for media rights in, in the NFL alone, leaving alone the rest of their sports content. And esports can't really replicate that because you don't have franchises that have organized together into a kind of negotiating bodies, so you don't have a standalone league uh, or standalone group of franchises that have come together. There was an attempt at this early on uh, called the G7, which was an organization of teams that was focused on really bring, making better rights for the teams in general and also uh, proliferating esports, but since then is, is sort of defunct and not really spoken about. So what happens is teams end up having to go to the other two models, which I'll get into for esports right now. And you have one model where an esports company uh, comes in. So you have your MLG, Major League Gaming, or ESL, which is the esports league. Both of them take a publisher's game and then uh, run events for it. So they'll create a league, they'll create a structure, they'll invite teams, and they'll go through that together with a game that isn't their own. The other model is work for a publisher to go out and go ahead and shell out that money themselves to create a whole production, the events, and everything on their own with the money they make from the uh, game itself. And these two models don't really leave room for the teams to kind of form their own group to negotiate. So if you look at Riot Games, for instance, they run the League of Legends Championship Series. That's an example of the model where you have a publisher creating a game and then creating the esports branch for it. And they cover all the costs and just in prize money alone in the third season, they spent eight million, which is unheard of in this area to spend on esports. And they've also acknowledged that it's not a profit point. They're not making money off of, of spending into the LCS. What they are getting is an ancillary benefit of, of deep connection and uh, bridging a gap that keeps uh, players interested, but also viewers interested. Uh, the other model, the ESL and the MLG, are entirely dependent on publishers. So if you look at this blue text here, um, publisher re relations and sponsorships account for the majority of the revenue in esports. And the issue here is how do you define media rights? Uh, is, is play derivative or is play a transformative object. So if a professional player plays, uh, who owns the rights to his media? Is he creating something unique, something individual, and something he could sell himself? Does he own that broadcast? Does the platform he's on own it? Or does the game developer get to come in and say, well, you know what? It's our game, our thing, so you know what? I'll own that too. So you have a really sticky situation here where esports are in constant kind of a precarious position because at any moment a publisher would say, "I don't want you broadcasting my game anymore. Uh, we're we're done after this contract," and then you no longer have that sponsorship or public publisher relationship, and you've lost out on that entire segment there. So it's a really interesting battlefield around IP that hasn't really come up too much yet. There's one example of the Korean Esports Players Association kind of signing out media rights and contracts to a game that hadn't come out yet. And when the game eventually did come out, uh, the publisher said, you know what, uh, I don't know why you did that. We don't want you to uh, be handling this sort of thing. And they, they cut off ties with the, the company entirely. So then they were in a, a horrible predicament of having contracts signed on something that no longer belonged to them. So the, the models that are apparent in uh, traditional sports just don't translate because you don't have that kind of league association, you don't have the commissioner or the um, owners of franchises being able to step in. Also in traditional sports you have a, a little battle between is it 
cheaper for me to buy out a franchise and get the media rights from the franchise directly, or to negotiate with the organization as a whole. And that's a constant struggle that's going to happen in traditional sports that's not really apparent in esports right now. So what we're looking at is that traditional sports probably isn't providing the model that we want for esports, and they should maybe move to a different model, one more like a music festival that subsists almost entirely off of sponsorship money uh, and funding through other means than media rights because it's just not going to work and there's going to be difficulty in the actual uh, execution. Okay. So to sum up, just to give you some takeaways here, uh, things I want to talk about are, are that the next generation of, of shoutcasters and, and that primary signifier of sports in esports is turning away from traditional sports. They're kind of creating their own thing and they're going to keep running with it. So you're seeing an industry kind of being pulled in, in multiple directions. One is all of the, oh, one thing I didn't get to mention in the last slide that I should is you have a huge influx of uh, television producers coming into esports and dictating the way that esports are looking and feeling and also offering up sponsorship models. So the thing you're running into is these television producers saying, we want to make it look more like television. If you look at the LCS, which is currently the, the top watched esport in, in the US and Europe, that is run by uh, Ariel Horn, who is an Emmy-winning uh, producer from NBC, and their work in the Olympics. And uh, the CGS was actually done by Mike Burks, who had won Emmys for his productions in NHL, NBA, and NFL. So you're seeing these TV producers come in and, and dictate the direction that the, the broadcast looks, and also talking to the caster, saying, you need, to, you need to do it this way. I'm used to doing it a certain way, and we're going to do it that way. But you have the casters kind of cognizant of the community that they've created and are feeling responsible for that and maintaining it. So you have this interesting separation of where the production wants to head and where the casters are kind of already heading, while still maintaining that relationship with the traditional sports feel. Um, so then the, the live streaming as a medium has these difficulties to figure out uh, especially around media rights. So each medium has faced a difficult transition phase. We're now seeing the emergence of esports broadcasting identity within the medium of live streaming. So instead of looking to uh, create its own thing, it's almost kind of backtracking. Unlike the other sports and other medium, it's, it's kind of becoming an earlier medium. It's becoming more like television instead of branching off on its, in its own direction where it, it has this really, really awesome uh, potential to become its own thing, its really unique thing, it's actually going backwards. And finally, uh, traditional sports media models are not easily replicated, especially the NFL. Uh, one thing I might point out is that there are multiple models, including FIFA and uh, uh, F1 racing, which, which follow a different trajectory, but are still uh, not not replicable in esports. One that might work is actually the NCAA, but you would have to have teams come together and create kind of organizations that bid out their media rights as opposed to the current model where you have the esports companies or the publishers dictating what's going on. Uh, so, with that, thanks everybody. I'll open up questions. Eric? So I'm curious about the media rights issue you talked about, and it reminds me of something that I ran into recently um, with, I mean, Nintendo being well known for going after classroom and going after people on YouTube for their videos and trying to sort of monetize those. Mm -hmm. And Nintendo's also not known for their sort of esports. You know, they don't have really esports presence. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, and so I think it would be, it would be interesting to see. I'm wondering if there's a case to be made then if the media rights system won't work the same way as the TV. There's a case to be made to publishers to be very open about the use of their material and that they can get sort of ancillary benefits through just, you know, becoming a popular person and you know, becoming an e that gets you a bigger, a bigger fan base or that you know, in the direction that are already popular. 
Yeah, so you're seeing that happen already because oftentimes uh, publishers aren't aren't really making money through investing in esports. What they are gaining is that ancillary benefit, that exposure, and that community basis, which is really important in esports. It's it's almost entirely community based. If if the people don't like your game, they're just going to stop playing it because they have a million other options to go to now. So. I would get. I would argue that publishers do need to be open and kind of allow these esports companies to uh, pick up and run with their product to help them create that community. And so far, you're you're seeing that they're they're relatively open. I mean, the Kespa case is the only one I know of uh, at this point where it's become an issue. But as things get more complicated and more money floods into it, you might start seeing some weird things happen, especially uh, Twitch being the primary platform. It currently has a relationship with all of these different publishers and it has a relationship with the esports companies. But at any moment, if they, if they chose instead to not just let this happen and not proliferate on their own and instead charge to host content on their platform or uh, make a much more prohibitive model, then you would see an entire reshaping of, of the industry for sure. Liam? Uh, I was curious about the style of broadcasting that they're doing, uh, sort of the audio signature of them, um, and thinking about traditional sports, there's an NFL on one hand, and then there's the salt on the other hand. Uh, do you see similar distinctions in the esports community in terms of the types of games, what types of games are being streamed, and uh, in my, I mean, I'm not expecting like Tiger Woods to be or a live stream, but like, it, are there maybe other styles of games with different pacing that are sort of different? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a really new upcoming esport is actually a card game, uh, well, a virtual card game. But the, the casting tone in that has to be different because it's a lot of downtime and a lot of like, well, what does he have? What could he do? So that, it still borrows that uh, two caster situation where you have one guy kind of giving you like, this is what's going on. This is the play-by-play. The -play. And then your second guy who's a really high level um, player or, or somebody with a lot of experience to explain to you like why he just did that and give the flavor to it. So, um, yeah, there are games coming out with different styles, um, and if you look, if you look across traditional sports too, and if you look at um, German uh, football, uh, they usually have a single caster with that, with no play-by-play -play slash color commentary. It's just one guy giving the cast saying like, "Oh, this this is the guy with the ball, and what just happened." Um, so you you have different variations, and also regional variations. Korea uh, will sometimes go up to six casters. On, on one game, and uh, League of Legends in, in North America has, has started doing triple casters for uh, their kind of finals and stuff. They they found out that that style works, and it's something that they've innovated themselves. So you're gonna you're gonna see shifts as as more games come out and casters become more comfortable. Well, so, drawing inspiration initially from sports and now from other casters in sports, and I'm wondering about uh, what's the conversation like between other forms of live casting around gameplay that do not include by sports at all? Let's say the next day, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, on evil style arcade. What, 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 watching people play an arcade game is very different from the sports at all. Yeah. And, and I'm just curious, is that conversation happening or are they still, like, these are such completely different mode of engagement that that's not much to I would. I haven't looked too much into the, the let's play and the, the solo casters, other than uh, kind of the esports players sitting down and, and casting, like uh, broadcasting their gameplay, where they'll once in a while say what they're thinking and doing. Uh, I would say that they're radically different in that the solo caster, the let's play guy, isn't. It's, it's not formalized in any way, and also they, they have a very individual style. Some, some talk a lot, some joke a lot, and, and I think it's a very different feeling. But you might, you might see as one becomes more common, it, there might be bleed over there, for sure. Uh, so, I'm always uh, reminded of the difficulty it was, it, it was for me to learn how to watch cricket. I didn't know what cricket was. I was exposed to it a number of times. 
And it's only when I finally played it that I actually understood the meaning of the count, why some people said that, that or whatever. So it seems to me that in the various genres and so forth of games, you have many, many different varieties and lots and lots of uh, sort of uh, requirement for people to be up to speed in order to understand what's going on in the screen, as your initial shot showed. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this factor into this, this, this question that you're looking at? Uh, and uh, maybe the second question would be just, what is the most popular eSport today, and you know, why is it so popular? Yeah, so to answer your first question about uh, kind of the expertise needed and how that factors into the East Coast broadcast. You're, you're touching on something that a lot of the casters do too in the idea of their audience and they all have this kind of formulation of the audience they're going out to and they all kind of assume that they're talking to people who play the game a lot. Hardcore players, if you will. Uh, so there's almost this expectation and this, this barrier of entry that the caster is going out to a hardcore player, and if you're not a hardcore player, this broadcast really isn't for you. Uh, they've run into certain issues where if they know that, oh hey, this is a really big event, it might be on ESPN3, or oh, we're gonna be on t television today, guys, and they they actively dumb it down, and they try to explain things as low as they possibly can without using any jargon, but they end up finding out, like the, the producer will come to them afterwards and say like, yeah, I need you to tone it down even more because nobody knows what an AWP is. Like, just bring it down a little bit more. So I think that's an issue that they're coming up against is the, the audience. But you're starting to see a K2 and, and Raisi, I know I'm messing up that pronunciation, but they actually, in their uh, investigation of esports live streaming, were saying that uh, it's actually becoming more of a spectator sport than it is uh, just players. So most not most, many uh, people who are into these games and into esports prefer to watch these high level esports over playing. Uh, they'd much rather see some high quality players go at it than they would um, play themselves. So the audience is shifting, that's for sure. What's the most popular? The most, <laughs> it's hard to say. The, the most popular, I would say right now, is League of Legends. Um, and that's uh, top down, it, it looks a little bit similar to what I showed earlier, but it's a completely different type of game. It's a five versus five. You're seeing team team games are becoming much more popular. What really made esports blow up, uh, especially in, in South Korea, is StarCraft, which is a one versus one uh, battle of wits almost. It's almost, if you imagine chess at an ultra fast pace, that's that's what StarCraft is. And that that's what really blew up in South Korea, but right now the most popular uh, shooter over in Asia is called Crossfire, and that's a that's a one versus one uh, first person shooter that goes way back to the origins of esports with like Quake and other like, one versus one contests. So it varies by region, but overall League of Legends is, is on top. Curious? So I've got a question with me from uh, Sean who's watching Cool. Um, and he's wondering whether your analysis uh, is located solely within the U.S. and European chatcast player and viewer communities, or whether Korean models and other uh, East Asian models are different, uh, and if so, uh, in what ways they are different? Sure. Um, I'm focused, and I should mention, I am focused primarily on North America and Europe. Uh, the Asian scenes, uh, both Southeast Asia and Chinese scenes, are very different. Uh, and South Korea has long been this kind of like Shangri-La of esports and, and it's really difficult to kind of wrap your head around because it is so ingrained in the everyday that it's, it's lived entirely different. The political economy behind it is, is different and it is, I mean people joke sometimes that StarCraft was the national sport of, of South Korea, but there are that many people into it and following it that it is on mainstream television. It, it, it's been on cable television since 98, maybe the early 2000s being the earliest, but it has many, many appearances on television and it is successful on television in South Korea, which has been shown not to work here. So I haven't really focused on that model as it is so specific to South Korea. And 
I would plug Dalyong Jing's book, uh, South Korea's Online Gaming Empire, here. Uh, and he does a fantastic analysis of the uh, political economy surrounding esports in South Korea. Anyone else? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank